see for the Word of God. Thank you. Hey, it's so good to have you. Um, thank you to Dean and Lisa and to Michelle for having me. And it's just such an honor to be here. I love True North. What, an, what a fantastic church. Aren't you guys so glad that you're in a, like the most amazing church in the northern suburbs? Like no offense to all the other churches, but you know, it is what it is. It's just good to be in the best church, I guess. Um, so huge hello, and hello to everyone online. Hello to everyone at the Malalu campus. And uh, it's just such a fantastic start to the year, don't you think? Can I ask you a question? Can we start that way? Can we start by asking a question? How's your New Year's resolution going? Yeah. If you're um, online or in uh, our other campus today, the collective groan kind of indicates how that's going. I'm not sure if that's the same response where you, where you are, but here it was this sound, mm, <laughs> all across the room. And uh, yeah, it uh, kind of feels that way, doesn't it? We're about, you know, that six week point into the year, mid-Feb, and already like the shiny new year has bit of scuff marks on it. <laughs> it's like when you get new sneakers and someone treads on them, you're like, thanks. Yeah, I thought that would go down well with you, Dean. All right, so, you know, I, to, not to bring us down a notch, but already this year, I just found myself getting rocked by, I, you know, thing after thing after thing. I started this year being like, I'm gonna read books, I'm going to get rich, lose weight, look amazing, you know, all the, all the usual, and um, get smarter. <laughs> and already this year, it's just like it's, some things have happened, some good things, but some hard things as well. Like the, the beautiful young girl whose life was taken by a shark a couple of weeks ago, the earthquake in Syria and Turkey, shocking, awful, awful. You know, it might just be the grind that you're back at school. <laughs> after a great summer off, whatever it is, I know that by this point in the year, whatever the promise the new year held, whatever sort of potential it had, whatever that sort of anticipatory, hopeful feeling that we have when the clock ticks over from December to January can't, can kind of wear off by right about now. And life starts rearing its head again and we start going, hmm, that's right, that's what life is like. That's what this world is like. Well, I have good news for you today. And that is that the experience of hope that we all sense, that sense of possibility, the sense of renewal, the fresh slate, blank page thinking that happens at the turn of January um, is not just for the start of a calendar year. It's not just restricted to that. The good news is that hope and renewal and being made new can be found in Jesus at any time. You see, having a revelation of Jesus is so important. When Jesus is revealed to us, it, we don't just see who he is. He's not just a man. He's not just a historical figure. We see who God is. We see what God is like. We see how much God loves us and how present he is with us. That's when we have a revelation of Jesus, that's when we receive real rest and real refreshing it's when we start to somehow have our priorities realigned. You know, the deepest soul um, thirst that we have begins to be quenched. Uh, somehow our perspective starts to shift. You know, somehow you're caught up in the greatness and the majesty of God. And somehow you stop thinking so much of your own problems when you have a revelation of Jesus. So if, like me, you're six weeks into the year and you're already finding yourself weary at times, today I'm going to share with you three unlikely places that God reveals himself and the hope that even in those places when you're feeling a little weary or a little like not as new as you want to be, you will be able to sense the renewal and the refreshing that comes from having a revelation of Jesus um, it's going to be a good time. Today we're going to be learning from the example in the, in the Bible of Elijah. 
And you can read about the story for yourself in 1 Kings. I believe the reference will come up on the screen, but it's like two whole chapters. So don't worry, I'm not going to like read it verbatim. <laughs> but you can read that for yourself, take a photo of the reference or look it up in your Bible. We're going to be hanging out there today. And Elijah really, I'll, t- I'll tell his story really quickly. He bursts onto the scene as a prophet in Israel with a declaration of drought. He says there's going to be no rain for years. And it happens. And then he just sort of goes back into obscurity for a few years. All right, Elijah. And he reappears later and he challenges hundreds of false prophets who follow the um, false god Baal. And he challenges them to a kind of intriguing, kind of extreme battle of the gods. Who's the real god showdown? Um, And the prophets of Baal, they're like all about it. So they're like, yeah, Baal's the real God. So they're dancing around. They're doing all of the rituals that they do to call on Baal. They cut themselves. They're starting to get more frantic. And Elijah taunts them. He's sort of standing by one to 450 false prophets being like, maybe Baal's asleep. Maybe just shout a bit louder. In my head, Elijah is sort of like the really like so disinterested Kardashian voice, like, like maybe he's asleep. In one point he goes, maybe he's doing a poo. Maybe if you shout louder. This is what Elijah's like. Eventually Elijah makes his move. The whole idea was that Whichever God was the real God would come down in fire and consume the offering that had been prepared. Now, it's been a drought for a few years. You guys know what it's like even if you light a spark in summer here in Australia. That thing's going to go up so quickly. But nothing had happened. So Elijah taunts these prophets even more, pours water all over the sacrifice just to make it harder. But then he prays to God, simple prayer, God, show us who you are. Fire comes down from heaven, consumes all of the burnt um, offering, all the sacrifice that had been prepared, all the water, and it's pretty definitive. God is the real God, not Baal. And so Elijah, um, he has proved that God is the real God. Elijah then slaughters by himself 450 prophets of Baal, prays in the end to the drought, and it begins to rain. And then he runs for his life from the queen, the boss of these false prophets, who is threatening to kill him. So Elijah, who has just shown extreme power, extreme trust in God, extreme strength in God, suddenly is on the run. And he is a broken man. Talk about highs and lows. I don't know if your year has felt like a roller coaster, but you're not alone. People of God have been, been on that ride for a long time. And so he is high, he is low, and he, on the run, he's actually suicidal. He wishes he was dead. And God ministers to him in that place with a simple ministry of rest and food. You know, sometimes God doesn't need a clap offering. He just needs your nap offering. (laughs) And that's a word I live by. (laughs) After, you can write that down. After God restores Elijah and he's back on his feet, he's had enough bread and he's had enough sleep. Come on, hallelujah. If anyone's on a keto diet, just consider that. Bread and sleep. All right. After God restores Elijah, Elijah travels down the mountain, or he travels up to the mountain. Sorry, you don't travel down to mountains. He travels up to the mountain of the Lord. He goes up to the mountain, and his desire is to hear from God and to find out what's next. Because obviously he's still scared. He doesn't want to go back to the place where his life is threatened. So he goes up there. He's on the mountain. A huge fire breaks out on the mountain. God isn't in the fire. A huge earthquake and a whirlwind roars, but God isn't in that either. And when the calm comes after that storm, God whispers. And that's when Elijah leaves his cave that he's been in, steps out, and God speaks to him. Elijah then hears from God, and he goes back and continues on his um, calling and his mission from God. And what I want to do is take this story and and sort of highlight to us three things that we can learn that we can learn from Elijah so that we can understand how God can reveal himself to us no matter what is happening. So point number one is that God is revealed in the fire. 
And throughout the Bible, God does reveal himself and he uses fire to draw his people closer to him. Think of Moses and the burning bush. Um, He also uses fire to purify and to make people holy. Think of Isaiah. I'm a man of unclean lips and an angel comes and puts fire on his lips to purify. Or the sacrificial system, burnt offerings. Uh, When the fire is endangering God's people, God steps in to rescue, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In a fire, God's power is revealed. And in a fire, God's holiness is revealed. And fire is a great metaphor for what we experience in our life when times get hard. Or perhaps when there's a welcome fire. Think of the warmth and the light that a fire can bring and it's welcome. Or maybe it isn't a welcome fire. Maybe it's too hot. Maybe you're feeling like you're getting a little bit burned. Either way, Isaiah 43, there is a promise from God that says, when we walk through the fire, we will not be burned. And God reveals himself through fire, just like he did with Elijah in front of the false prophets. He will be present in a fire. He will purify you in a fire. He will protect you in a fire. You don't need to fear fire. It's just another opportunity to witness God's mighty power to save and his holiness at work. When God is revealed in his power and in his holiness, it causes our perspective to change. When you have a revelation of just how powerful he is and of how holy he is, something in you begins to change. You suddenly have a new perspective. Our priorities begin to align with his. Perhaps you're already experiencing a fire this year in your health, in a relationship, perhaps in a business scenario that you're facing. You don't need to fear the fire. Don't let it distract you. Ask God to reveal himself through the fire and watch him work in that situation. The second place in Elijah's story where God reveals himself is that he reveals himself in the whisper. Now, Elijah had experienced the revelation of God in the fire. Didn't, isn't that like the definitive proof of God revealing himself, that all these false prophets dance for hours and are cutting themselves and going frantic and nothing happens. And then Elijah prays one prayer and God shows up in the fire. God is revealed. So Elijah knows God is revealed in the fire. And he's up on this mountain and there's a massive fire. But God wasn't in the fire. You know, Elijah had prayed in a drought and then prayed out a drought and prayed in the rain, and a wind whipped up the clouds and brought rain to a drought-stricken land. And up on the mountain, a wind and a storm came, but God wasn't in the wind. So both times where Elijah had experienced God in the fire, God revealed in the wind, God's power on display. Up in the mountain, he wasn't, God wasn't in those moments. God wasn't in the fire. God wasn't in the wind. God was in the whisper. And there has been many, many times in my walk with God where I feel like God has been silent so many times. I'm like, why aren't you talking? You're so rude. Where are you? (laughs) I'm talking here. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm probably more like the prophets of Baal getting frantic (laughs) than I am about full confidence like Elijah. I'm like, where are you? Why aren't you talking? Why aren't you telling me what to do? Just tell me. I'll do it. I'll go to India. I don't mind. Like, just tell me what to do. And (laughs) And I sit there. I'm like, God, why aren't you talking? I probably, I reckon there's probably only one, maybe two times actually out of the hundreds of times where I've said, God, you're being silent where God has actually been silent. All of the other times he was speaking, I just wasn't listening. (laughs) Or I was expecting him to speak in a certain way and only tuning into that and ignoring the way that he was speaking to me. You have to learn to discern the voice of God. Expecting God to speak in the same way all the time will create a monotone experience of spirituality for you. But God isn't monotone. He's in stereo. 
He is that surround sound you experience that deafens and blinds you at the beginning of a movie. He is a full body, full sensory, 4D experience. Hebrews says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He may be the same, but he isn't static. Yeah? You can expect him to surprise you, and he is always speaking. It's in the journey of a follower of Jesus. It's, it's our path to understand and discern his voice in every moment. The big moments, the small moments, the fires, the winds, the whispers. And so if you've been struggling to hear God speak lately, don't worry. You are not alone. I reckon half the week I'm like, God, why aren't you speaking? <laughs> and I realize he is. I just need to tune in and actually focus on and discern where he is speaking in my life. You're not alone. We all journey through that place. So why is it important to hear God speak? Why is it important to pick up where he's speaking in your life? Because when God reveals himself in the whisper, when he speaks to you, when he speaks, you can receive clarity. You can receive direction. You receive your calling. You have a better understanding of your capacity. However, ultimately, the voice of God reveals the character of God and who he is. And when you have a revelation of who God is, you have a deeper revelation of yourself also, of what you're doing here with your life, of what God is wanting to do through you. The place of revelation is a place of transformation. It's important to hear the voice of God so that you can have a revelation of him. You hear God in the fire. He's revealed in the fire. He's revealed in the whisper. And we've probably covered the two most famous parts of Elijah's story. But I hope you've received a new revelation of potentially how you could hear God speak to you this year. But there's still one way that God revealed himself to Elijah that I want to touch on today. And I'm believing that this is going to help those of you who have been like diligently, faithfully waiting on God for something. And that is that God is revealed in the going. And I, if I could have my friends from the band up, because I just want to start ministering to you. And I want to start a time where we actually focus on um, where is it that you're speaking, God? But this last place that God reveals who he is and what he's like is in the going. Have you ever had a revelation that changes everything? Maybe you're a woman in this place and you've had the privilege of being pregnant and that first moment where you find out that you're pregnant, suddenly nothing's changed, but everything's changed. The way that you view your body is completely different to five seconds earlier. What about when you're a kid? All of us can relate to this. You're a kid, you wake up in the morning, and for those first few seconds while you're waking up, you don't remember, but then you do. It's your birthday. Do you remember that feeling where nothing has changed, but everything has changed? Elijah had climbed a mountain to meet with God, and he must have been so relieved to hear God speak to him. You know, Elijah had come all that way, and he had got what he came for, the voice of God. However, God didn't say, Elijah, you have arrived. It was more like a, Elijah, we're about to start. And so often we expect that if we could just get God to answer us, if he could, we could get him to show up, if he could intervene in this situation or in that situation, our challenges and our problems would be solved. It would be finished, problem over. However, we read in Elijah's story that he was actually called back the same way that he had come. He walked right back down that mountain, the same road to the same situation that he had been running from. But he was not the same. He had experienced on that mountain a revelation of God. And sometimes I see God miraculously break through and intervene, changing situations supernaturally. And it's astounding when it happens. Other times I experience God break through in me and invite me back into the same situation, but with a changed disposition. 
And that change is not something that I can conjure up on my own. That change is not something that I can cause within myself. That change is not something that I can put on and fake it till I arrive and till I make it that way. When you meet Jesus, you find that He doesn't often take away all your problems. He never offers to do that. He doesn't say, come, follow me. I'll take away all your issues. I'll take away all your problems, all those things that you're battling. I'll take them away. His simple invitation is just to follow Him and trust. He says, I'll make you. He says, follow me and I'll make you. So if you've been seeking a revelation from God, but you feel He hasn't been revealing Himself, that's a hard place to be in. I identify with that. I've been there many, many times. Can I encourage you to keep walking? Keep following Jesus. Keep your eyes on God. It's as you keep going and as you keep walking that God reveals Himself. He reveals Himself as you go. You know, sometimes when we're driving a car, you try and steer it out of your driveway when it's not working. And it's a lot harder than when you just make a minor change when you're going 100 k's on the freeway. You know, so it's like that in our life. Sometimes it's in the going that we quicker, that we realise quicker that God is actually moving in us and directing our path. It's in the going that He reveals His plans, His purposes, His character for us. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says, Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we may be wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, on God, on the revelation of who He is. See, since what we see is temporary, but what is unseen, what we're fixing our attention on is eternal. And this morning, we're going to take communion in a few minutes. And the way that I want us to take communion today, the posture that I would love us to have is to consider what it is that we would like to invite Jesus in to do and to renew within us. Potentially, you're facing a fire in your life. Maybe it feels like 2023 is already a dumpster fire and you're like, well, let's just hold out until 2024. Maybe it'll be a better year. You've already classed this year as a write-off. Maybe your year looks like a fire. Maybe your year looks a little bit chaotic. Fires, winds, waves. (laughs) And you're like, God, where are you in this? Maybe there are quiet moments where God wants to whisper to you, where you need to hear His voice. There are things in the moments of chaos that He wants to renew. He wants to bring out a revelation of who He is in those moments. Potentially, you have been asking and seeking God for a breakthrough. There's something that you've been asking and praying for for a long time. Something that's deeply held within your heart and you just just wish God would do it. And God is inviting you this morning to say, hey, I'm I'm gonna heal you on the way. I'm gonna reveal myself on the way. And it's time to start moving and making a decision and moving on, trusting that God is gonna bring that renewal. And so this morning, I would love to pray for us. And could we all stand across church? Even if you're in your living room, go on, just do it. Stand up. Let me pray for you as we finish off our time together. God, my prayer is simple. Would you come and reveal yourself? Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. You are welcome in our fires. You are welcome in our storms. You are welcome in the long journeys that we wish we didn't have to take. You are welcome. God, would you reveal yourself? God, would you show us who you are and what you're like? Clever words don't amount for much. What we want 
is you. We want to be seeing you. We want to be hearing your voice. Help us to bring all of these situations and place them at your feet and be reminded that you are the same God who says, behold, I am making everything new. God, would you make us new today? Would you create in us a new heart, a new spirit, a new way of living? Would you renew us and give us the energy that we need to face the week ahead, the year ahead, whatever it is that we're facing? God, we're trusting that you are the one who can truly make us new by the power of what Jesus has done on the cross and from his resurrection and the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. We live in that reality right now. We bring our situations into alignment with that reality and we speak over them, declaring that the power that raised Christ from the dead is still available for us today and that we trust your character, God, that you make all things new. And so, Lord, we submit our lives and we surrender our lives to you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Team, if we begin to sing um, in a moment and we're going to take communion, the way we do it is come down the front. Um, there'll be people down here to pray with you if you'd like to take communion. There's also people on the side as well if, there's, if the front gets uh, full up. But as we take communion today, I want you to be reminding yourself for whatever that situation, maybe you're a year ahead, you're like, this year is going to be a great year. Ask God to reveal himself in the good times. Don't ignore him. Don't miss that whisper. So what I would love you to do is when you take that communion, you're reminding yourself of Jesus' death and resurrection. You're saying, God, I thank you that you're the type of God who not only takes what is bad and transforms it, but you bring new life into places that were once dead. And speak that over your situation so that you can experience the real rest, the real refreshing, that thirst quenching reality of God in your soul. All right, let's begin to worship. And when you're ready, come and take communion.